Hello everybody and welcome to a, another definitive analysis, a lecture on a story that I uh, don't think you're going to see many people covering, uh, whether it be in classrooms, on YouTube, but it's a story that once I read it I was hooked, uh, once I started uh, covering it with students they definitely got hooked, I'll never forget one particular 11th grade class. Uh, they really enjoyed it. Um, uh, they just had a lot of interest in it, right? And, and it really kind of, sh uh, uh, sh uh, it was really something that uh, shone brightly uh, in the classroom. So I, I like this story a lot. First of all, the author, uh, I'll be quick on intros. Frederick Pohl, a uh, prominent science fiction writer, but even more than that, if you uh, read on some background information on this uh, individual, he was an agent, he was an editor, so he really was totally engulfed in the world of science fiction, and he's a pretty good writer too. Um, this story we're going to uh, cover here will definitely be in two parts um, because it's a 20 pager. I think the way this was uh, originally published was probably periodically, and you can tell when Paul is kind of in planting some of those cliffhangers uh, to keep us ready for the next installment or the next issue. We, of course, have the full thing here ready to go. We'll cover half of it, um, but a wonderful author. You know, I feel like if I'm one of the only people covering this story in particular, YouTube is a barren wasteland when you think of certain authors, it, it, at least it seems. I think all your notable anthologized authors uh, uh, get more than enough uh, airtime. Um, I'm, I've haven't really checked the contemporary scene too much, but um, I know in terms of Frederick Pohl, you don't find a lot about his work. Even his major uh, uh, set, uh, novel, Gateway, which is kind of a, a four-part series, um, even that being as great as it is, doesn't get a lot of uh, publicity. And you don't find a lot of people analyzing these things. Well, here we go with The Kindly Isle. And what I like about this science fiction story is that it doesn't feel that science fictiony. And uh, before I go any further, just yeah, the, the late great Frederick Pohl. I'm glad to be covering literature from these great writers uh, as it seems that a lot of people aren't doing this kind of stuff. Let's get into it. So I like this story because it doesn't come across as science fiction until you get to a certain plot point, uh, a certain kind of thread that goes through it. Um, it's called The Kindly Isle, right? Uh, in other words, island. And it very much takes place on a Caribbean island. I've had the, uh, I've, I've had the uh, uh, privilege, the pleasure of going uh, to a couple of these places, like Hawaii uh, feels kind of similar to this in terms of that island environment. I've also been to Belize, which is not an island. There are some islands off Belize, so very coastal, right? Warm water, warm temperature countries. Even Paul will make that distinction in this, uh, in this text. You know, governments that come from cold countries, uh, governments, you know, in places that come from these warmer uh, waters. And right when we get into it, uh, I, the way I cover these stories, as you know, is chronologically just straight on through um, because everything builds upon itself. It's broken into a few parts here, I think four altogether, if I'm not mistaken. Here we start with part one. And right away we're introduced to uh, the narrator, uh, the main character's guide on this uh, job that he's doing on this island, and this is Mr. Cavillan. Now this is one of those stories where the names are chosen perfectly, deliberately by the author to make sure that it comes packed with meaning that is suggested for us to use as we do this analysis, right? As we try to make sense of, uh, of, of how to put it all together. And it's wonderful. Cavillan is poet, right? Cavillan is poet, if you look up the name. I guess this is where cavalier probably comes from, right? Uh, the adjective. But it's the poet. And right away, I think this is helpful, is to consider two different kinds of, uh, let's say, roles in the world. Uh, and let's remember the backdrop. Now, The Kindly Isle, if you've read it, uh, you know. Uh, and if you haven't, well, it's just kind of part of the, uh, uh, the overall context here. The backdrop in this story is the Cold War between the United States and USSR, right? Um, so it's about the, 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 the weapons uh, race, in this case, we get into biological weapons, right? That some of the characters, including our main character, uh, w has worked on in the past, right? 
So they're very much a part of that world of governmental conflict, right, of these huge superpower countries, especially when we think back to, I believe this story was probably written in the 60s. So, um, you know, there's a lot to say about the context of the Cold War between these two major countries, the United States and USSR, right, that we have. All right, so here we are given a poet. This is his, essentially his helper when he first gets to the island uh, to go look at some property, right, to do the job that he has to do for this real estate hotel, hotel real estate company that he works for. So he's introduced to, to the poet. Think about that context we just talked about a moment ago. Who is the poet the exact opposite of? The warmonger, the governmental weapons employee, uh, people who make weapons for a living, right? And I, I, I personally know some people, you might as well, people uh, who are involved in that industry, all right? So notice we have war and government and those positions already contrasted highly with this idea of poet. And who is the poet? He or she is someone who is sensitive, open-minded perhaps, um, maybe there's more of a uh, um, being in tune with, say, nature, right, and things of nature, whereas military seeks to essentially use or destroy nature to its own ends, right? So you can start to note some key differences. Beautiful how the story starts off. Going along with that, um, for anybody who's gone on a vacation before and you arrive at your destination, there's a hotel, right? There's a place you're staying. Um, you know you know what it's like to come into a place and see other guests, right? And that's what we have here early in the story as our narrator. Uh, we have a first person narration, right, with this story. Uh, when our narrator arrives, uh, and notice I'm not even giving his name yet because chronologically in the story, it's not given to us until later on. Things are kind of uh, pieced out for us, which is kind of nice. Um, the hotel that he is arriving at, take note, is a wonderful place. I want to point out a couple details that really set an, a, a, a start of optimism and gentleness, right? Here we go. First of all, I want to take note of the name Deirdre, uh, which is the, uh, one of the, the head host's names, right? Deirdre. And she is basically just taking a lot of complaints from uh, different hotel guests, right? Especially the ones that are arriving. Notice that they are highly agitated, right? They're just, ah, this has been a horrible trip already. Getting here, right? Traveling here. And they're already in a bad mood, right? To put it generally. But here comes Deirdre. Every name in this story is chosen for a reason. So if you take this, right, and you look it up, I only know this because I've most recently covered this story with the, my wonderful ninth graders last year. Uh, I covered this story with a lot of different grades. Uh, it's really good. Very, I think, accessible in terms of the interest. Deirdre is an Irish girl's name, and it harkens back to a legend uh, about a young princess who wanted to marry uh, some regular Joe Schmo who wasn't prince or king, right? There seems to be a dozen of these stories. Um, she refuses to kind of marry this guy, he, uh, this, this, uh, this wealthy guy, right? That guy kills her, uh, uh, her lover. She kills the person that she loves. The king has it done. And so what does she do? I believe she commits suicide in anguish of losing that one true lover. Um, I think what it does for us by having this name here and even reading into that backstory is it it starts to get into this idea of loss not being able to have the person that you want and as we find out in this story that's going to be important for jerry who has lost somebody special i'm going to keep on going here another detail we see very uh, uh we see here in the beginning as he arrives is the bell captain uh, one of the people who's kind of bringing uh bags right and, and everything's getting brought to your rooms Usually these, pa these people are very ready and prepared for their tips, right? Almost with the hand out. That is what Jerry is used to. He goes on a lot of these trips where he's looking at things for his real estate company. But guess what? I'll just put this up. The guy didn't have his hand out for a tip. 
which shows that it's not all about the money. It's not all about the money. Well, why is that an important theme, right? You might ask, well, let's start to think about what money means to a capitalist society, and let's start to think about what money means to a communist society. We know capitalism. We live it, we breathe it. There's no shaking it off you every single day of your life. You don't know anything else unless you've lived under a different economic system governmental, etc. We, we don't. We have capitalism. Jerry knows capitalism. He's from the United States. But this idea of not expecting money, not expecting money as some kind of reward, or, or, or beyond that, just being very aggressive toward money and wanting to have as much of it as possible, resources, no matter what you have to do, right? Well, guess what? With this guy, Money doesn't matter. And I, I wanna, I'm going to put that here. Money doesn't matter, right? That's an, an interesting theme, orthomatic statement, right? You could say it definitely does, and we could start to have the great debate, right? But that's an interesting theme, the, the, the importance of money. Is it needed or not? Is it more of a problem? Moving on. Very literally, he is here on behalf of a Maui hotel resort looking for acquisitions, looking for more property, all right, just to be clear, all right? And it's his job to check out, check out physical and financial aspects of a specific project. He knows the money. Jerry is very much a money guy, um, moving, uh, and I think in a way that speaks to Paul's background only in the sense that he knew money in terms of how to run a magazine, right? He definitely had that experience. So you write what you know at the end of the day, you're going to create a character, you know, make it the guy who deals with the financials if that's what you know, but it's still in a hotel industry, which you might not know that much about. Poles teamed up with other authors in his lifetime. I think they get the name was Cornbluth, and they wrote a, a, a decent book called Space Merchants, The Space Merchants. And uh, again, he teamed up with this guy just because he seemed to know a certain industry better than he did, um, from what I remember uh, reading. All right, back to this. One thing we find out in this information, this exposition, right, which is background, um, it's given, given to us piece by piece. Our main character, uh, our narrator, was a government employee. I covered this briefly in the beginning. He worked for a U.S. government lab. Starting to touch upon, uh, so touch upon some other really nice themes here. We get a description uh, of his clothing. Uh, as he arrives to this island, ready to do the work that he does, our main character here. Uh, and this is Mr. Wenwright, all right? So Dick Cavillan is the, uh, uh, the helpful uh, person, real estate agent, helping him look at uh, this property that he's going to look at. Uh, and uh, Jerry works for his hotel industry, right? Uh, and his, his last name is Wenwright. Let's do a quick translation. It's wagon maker, all right? Somebody who makes a wagon. We're starting to think of occupations. Cavillan is poet. We already talked about the idea of you know, government and war as an occupation. Here we have wagon maker. I'm never really clear on exactly what to make of it, but I can definitely take some guesses. But at this point, we'll just keep on moving on. What do we know about Mr. Wenwright? The way he's dressed is all white, right? Uh, and what I want to bring attention to is the golden insignia of his Maui hotel that he has over his heart. So he wears the company's pin right here smack on his heart and i always stop here and ask with my students what does that suggest on a more figurative level what does that say about jerry if he's got the pin golden no less of his hotel right on his heart and just to give some quick answers which i think are great ideas uh we'll come up with um well it shows that he's very dedicated to his job right and that's one of the key ideas here is that dedication you have to your job are you so, and here comes that new theme, are you so dedicated to your job that you're not dedicated to something else like a friend or a family member or a spouse? Um, something along those lines, children, right? When does the job start to be a problem and, and it's less of a help in a, situ in a situation? So think about where we're right in the beginning of the story where he likes to keep that uh, pin. Uh, now, I like this next one because it brings me back to my childhood a little bit. My father owned a Saab, and it's a car, an old Swedish car, had a, a very unique design to it. Um, and 
what it's what it's being the way it's being used here i believe it's kind of punning on the word if i'm not mistaken a, a kind of a proper noun now saab is spelled s-a-a-b that's the old company they don't make cars anymore all right you probably have to pay a lot of money to get it uh, 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 um, a working sob these days and we're pulling the sob here's the here's what said he pulled his open sob out of the cramped hotel lot found a gap in the traffic greeted two friends All right so the way sobs being used here of course is he pulled the car out that they were driving but we also can think of it as sob as in to cry right as we, un as we start to understand, we're on an emotional, a major emotional journey with Jerry, right? Once we see, start to see the metaphor in, that is intact here, uh, and then all these additional ones. So we look at it as SOB, as in crying, uh, again, on this emotional journey uh, that we're starting here with Jerry. So he pulls it out of the cramped hotel lot, which could mean on a metaphorical level, letting our emotions out, being able to cry, right? Starting to be able to cry again. Um, maybe, maybe even in front of other people, and we'll see that, uh, how important that can be later on as well. Found a gap in the traffic. We all know how pleasant that can be, especially living in the LA, greater LA area, finding a gap in traffic and <laughs> taking off, right? And, and as you uh, zoom towards your destination. And here's the, maybe the most important thing here at the end greeted two friends right dick cavillan uh is a, a regular right he lives on this island uh and works and so he's greeting friends and again just that theme of friendship do you find it important is it not so important right what are other statements you can make about friendship right that could be interesting and perhaps debatable as well so a lot of interesting themes starting to arise here a little bit of the mystery is plugged in here quite needed quite neededly um in a, in a, a little bit of the mystery is plugged in here and it, it's i think it's much needed because it has to keep some level of suspense and plot going with the story or, or else we you know wouldn't have much to look forward to here and it's this figure this very important figure named professor michaelis right and let's think about the first name i'll just to give it now First name is Vale, so essentially we have Vale Michaelis. Vale means valiant, right? That's a pretty nice uh, adjective, right? That's a nice one to compact with your name, so valiant. And then Michaelis actually is a reference to the archangel Michael, uh, which then essentially leads us to a question as far as I understand, whose power is greater than God? And it's a rhetorical question, meaning nobody. Uh, the archangel Michael, I was watching this the other night, was said to be one of the most powerful angels on the side of God, right? That was fighting uh, in his favor. Um, so anyways, it's quite a name here for Professor Michaelis, and we'll find out more about him later on. Jerry, uh, Mr. Wenwright here, thinks he sees him, and that takes him back to a prior stage in his life, all right? All right. The island is said to be a nice place, all right? There's nothing... There's no hidden worm in the mangosteen, which is an idiom to say there's no like deeply hidden problem that will arise later on and everything else seems fine, right? It looks perfect because it is perfect. And I like there, there's, a, there's a very important theme that I don't want to say too much about at this point, but a state of perfection. Getting back to times of pleasure, right? And joy, and maybe even rest because we all know how important rest can be at 7 30 p.m every night once the kids are down right but maybe that's a part of that pleasure as well um so here on this island everything seems from what mr wenwright can see perfect right now the property that he's going to be uh this is getting back to plot but it's all metaphorical um the property he's going to be taking a look at for his company in terms of an acquisition taking it over buying it uh, is a three-quarter built hotel casino resort thing, right? Uh, and it's got some work that needs to be done, right? The owner, uh, the, the prior builders, the people working on this project, ran out of money and essentially had to walk away from the project, all right? 
we also find out on a literal level that there have been a lot of there's been a lot of theft uh, and ransacking, ransacking and um, uh, vandalism that's taken place to the hotel by locals. Right now, early on, I think it's important to th here we have this hotel right that we have this hotel surrounded by a fence. Right there was eventually after there was so much looting taking place and whatnot, they put up a fence just to deter. What they, could, what they could from that point on, all right? So that's what we have literally, three-quarter built hotel, not in great condition in terms of vandalism and stuff taken out, needs a lot of repair, especially on the exterior, um, surrounded by a fence. But it's gonna be something on a metaphoric, metaphorical level, on a figurative level as well, right? Now, we'll get there in just a moment. One motif I think is uh, important to note here as we get very good. I'm, you notice I'm not going into too much detail about these big paragraphs that just have description uh, of what they're looking at with this resort site. But one that I think stands out, in fact, it's the last sentence uh, of, uh, of, of the paragraph, a marble dolphin fountain had been broken off and carted a few steps away and then left shattered on the walk. Uh, and you know, that speaks that we analyze this in terms of meaning. We get a couple things. The first I would say is that idea of just giving up, right? You try to carry something away that is, seems important, right? This marble statue of a dolphin, and then you just kind of surrender, you give up, you surrender, you let it go, and pfft, it's just kind of a waste at that point, right? So I think that's one idea. The other is just taking note of the dolphin, right? Because we will have some motifs in the story, dolphin being one of them, that will contrast with some other uh, motifs as well, right? And we'll, we'll have this kind of gathered meaning uh, that we can, we can go on from there. So just note the dolphin here has been smashed to pieces. Last thing Jerry asks about uh, is water av availability. <clears throat> and even that is going to be metaphorical. We'll cover that in just a moment. But just how are we going to get water into this place? It looks like we need some water. And they smell something funny. Uh, right before the um, section ends. Uh, and I will talk about that in just a moment. Okay. This is kind of cool. We get a, 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 a a moderately sized expense sheet. And all of this is very literal. What needs to be repaired? What damage needs to be uh, uh, you know, fixed, right? In order for this resort to be a place where people can come and we can be operational, right? What is it gonna take? And the money adds up. I think uh, this story was written a long time ago, so nowadays it would probably be even more money, right? Most likely. Um, but it but it adds up, and so let's take a look at some of these. First one is relocation of cemetery. Now we know on islands, uh, when we look at their burial grounds, cemeteries, it all nothing is buried. No one is buried underground. They don't put coffins underground because of the prevalence of flooding, and then that can like bring up unseemly odors and unsettle those coffins essentially. So they everything's above ground in these kind of concrete. Uh, boxes, right? Coffins, I guess you could say. So, what does it mean, right? What does it mean on a figurative level? Well, we know later on that Jerry has, Mr. Wenwright has lost his wife, right? Marge. Um, and so, maybe we're starting to get insights through the hotel uh, and the damage done to it uh, about what may have happened and what needs to be done for Jerry to deal with this issue. So relocation of cemetery. This place was built on top of one of those old cemeteries. They got to relocate that. It's going to cost, as it says, 350000 um, Maybe on a metaphorical level it means get your the loss of your wife out of your mind. Stop letting it be a problem for you, right? Stop lingering on that loss. Stop having it hinder you from moving forward, all right? So relocation of cemetery, relocation of his dead wife, right? And the memory and the thought of her. 
And remember, some of the thoughts could be quite helpful and healthy and useful when we remember people that we've lost, right, that are lost from our lives. But on the other hand, it could lead to problems you could imagine too. Uh, we have a couple other things I want to look at on a metaphorical level. New water mains. I think this one is going to be almost like the, the pipes coming up all the way up to your eyes and providing tears, emotion, release, uh, an outlet of that despair, anguish, etc., etc. right? Water mains. We've got to connect this water. Whoosh, let it come out. Paving access road. Uh, so just an access road, I would imagine, for big trucks and such uh, to uh, get into. Uh, the premise uh, of the resort but we think about this on a metaphorical level uh, it's more maybe access to Mr. Wenwright access to our main character right or in broader a broader way of looking that is somebody who's kind of been on their own for a while maybe it's time to build that road and put in the effort and the money to make sure that somebody else can come in if that's what you're looking for and what I love about this story is it hasn't said much about Marge and such. Of course, I've read this many times, but if we really start to dig into the detail provided, look into the metaphorical meaning of this, it's giving us so much information, right? Uh, moving forward. So, uh, Kavlin, he gives a little bit of information about himself. We find out he is also a widower. He lost his wife, very similar uh, to our main character. Uh, also from the States, lived in Michigan, right? He was part of a company called Selman and Cavillan, right? A real estate company. Now, this is, again is a very interesting paradox for us. Selman and Cavillan, Cavillan translates to poet. Selman essentially is a man that sells. Right? You don't have to take you don't have to get too far off there, which means a business person, right? Businessman or woman? Poet. Are there differences between these two mentalities? These roles that these individuals play in our society, the type of person that you end up being based on these roles? I would say yes. Right? I would definitely and I think some of you would, would agree. I would definitely say yes, right? So it's an interesting paradox that we have with Kavlin. If he's poet, he came from a background in which he was completely intertwined through practice, it seems, right? A, a business, uh, real estate, with somebody who represents the opposite of poet, business, right? The business. And when you start to think about government, um, there's definitely a large business aspect to government, you could imagine, right? Um, they get on a, um, well, they're having a conversation. While they're doing this, they share Cuban perfectos. And you would say to yourself, well, that's wonderful. Cuba's known for the like, best cigars in the world, right? I can't say I like cigars. It's too much, too much smoke. And it's very smelly. They are nice, though. There's a nice element to them, too, uh, in some way. Uh, if you're old enough, of course. But uh, why Cuban? Well, it's to reference a communist country, a notable communist country, even in the 60s, I believe, when he's writing this, a notable communist company, right? To make us think about not only those countries, but those conditions, those uh, systems that are in place in which those countries operate as well. All right. We get toward the end of this section bringing us to the end of the first part and Jerry has a choice to make. I can stay at the hotel site and look at more stuff or I can go back to my hotel at the port where I'm staying and just get back to work because there's a lot of work that he's got to get through, right? Paperwork, stuff like that. The boring stuff, I guess you could say, right? But the necessary stuff as well. Um, and he went back to work. Remember we talked about the gold pin that he keeps of his work on his heart. He's very fond of just getting back to work here. Maybe it's a routine he prefers and he's just uh, used to. All right, another thing to take note of, this is one of, this is where we get that science fiction element that I haven't said much about at all up to this point. Notice he gets a choice between lobster and beef um, and he ends up choosing the beef, all right? So he, he eats some beef. What is he, he, he like, and you might be asking me, you know, why does that matter? 
we'll get to it, all right? But there's the science fiction element to it. What they're eating does matter. And we're getting little clues here early on. It's easy to see them upon a second, third read of this story, right? Whatever, uh, whatever read, out, read of it you're on, but I just want to make you aware of that early on. What they eat does matter. I sound like a nu nutritionist or something right now. A little strange. Okay, what happens though? He eats the beef and then he goes upstairs and what does he do? He cries. And I'll read this. The only question was whether I would cry myself to sleep. I still did that after eight years, about one night in three. And this was a night I did. So what does this reveal? Deep grief, deep sadness for the loss of his wife. We don't know a lot about how that happens. We will by the end of this long story. Uh, but crying all the time, right? In fact, one night in three. Take note of three. Probably some numerology taking place here. Especially because three, when you look at religions throughout the world, I believe, Three is such an important number in terms of symbolism, representation, how it's used. So three is very important. In the Western world, if you're looking at Christianity, you know, Catholicism, whatever, uh, those, those major ones, at least within America, um, if you're looking at it from that standpoint, three is rebirth, starting over, and I think that notion definitely applies so far in the story in terms of loneliness and feeling disconnected perhaps, right? Uh, and, and other things as well, what we've done in our past. Can we find a, a way to have a, a be different and move forward from there? Right, a rebirth of some kind. All right, part two. Two starts with Jerry and this woman that he encounters, um, getting rid of their cups of quarters. And so here we have two people deliberately just throwing their money away. And again, what's behind this? For me, I read into it as a subtle reference to the idea of money, not needing it. Imagine living in a non-capitalist state where you didn't have to worry about money, right? And this is just one story dealing with this theme. Um, but I think that's the idea. Starting to, to consider that idea of, of, of money here, right? All right. Um, what we start to notice about incoming tour, uh, tourists, incoming guests uh, on this island at this hotel he's staying at is they are irritable, they're angry, they are kind of vengeful. Like if something went bad on the flight, they want to take it out on the airline, they want this to be paid for, they're going to... Here we find out that there's a possible negligence suit over a missing garment bag, so they're going to sue because some clothing has been lost. Right? Complaining about bugs, um, etc. So it's just a very, it's a group that loves to complain. And to give you this more interest right off the bat, just think about this idea of who we are naturally as human beings. In your opinion, and I guarantee Everyone's all over the place with this one. Do you think we're naturally happy, cooperative individuals who are more than likely to get along and share space? Or uh, are we uh, kind of angry and get mad at each other and are kind of litigious, want to argue and, and get back at each other? How do you think human beings are, are naturally kind of brought into this world, right? It's one thing to say who we are naturally. It's another thing to say who we are based on the conditioning that takes place in a, in, in a particular society that we live in. But I'll ask you that question. Who do you think we are naturally, right? He's going back into the hotel site, all right? And he's taking a few literal objects, a notebook, a hammer, a Polaroid camera. For the young folk out there, I gotta tell you to go look at a Google image of that or watch a YouTube video of a Polaroid camera being used. Um, it's not just a filter. It's not just a filter. Um, so he's got a Polaroid camera. Right, comes right out. And he's got a Swiss Army knife. Again, go look up some images on Google, but you can see this is a, a small tool. Can be rather large too, the major one, the massive one. But uh, it's, it really speaks to versatility, right? So that, that's what I want to do here quickly. A notebook. Why is he bringing that into this resort site, this half, this, this three-fourths completed resort, just to take notes. What needs to be fixed? What's going on over there? Okay, better write that down. 
right? oh concrete needs major work in this area right whatever a hammer not to pew, pew, smash things down it's more to tap as you'll see him do tap the integrity of this beam or this slab of concrete right whatever it's going to be it's more for testing and polaroid makes sense right you just want to have memories right be able to walk away with a real image and lastly is the swiss army knife i had mentioned versatility right being able to tackle any problem adaptability that might come your way all right this morning as he arrives with all this stuff uh the wind if that was bringing the scent of death and the cemetery that was built this was built on top of is going and you know it's being blown into a different part of the beach that day right so away from him what does this mean figuratively speaking maybe the thought of his wife is less on his mind right the loss of his wife the whole context surrounding that is less on his mind this morning as he arrives right everything that's what i love about this story is everything seems to be um uh readable we can analyze it on a figurative level now there's uh, something I'll bring quick detail to here, which is there's a hole in the fence. Remember they put up that fence, they got sick of the looting and the vandalism, they put up a big fence, and there's a big hole in it. And it looks like somebody cut it and they've been going in and out for a long time now, right? Kind of sneaking in and sneaking out. Now it sounds like a horrible thing. Somebody's gonna steal stuff over and over, right? They got a little routine going here. What's going on? But one word will stand out to me um, that I think changes the perspective here, which is brighter. It says, and the links had been rubbed brighter than the rest, the rest of the fence. And bright obviously is light and light is good, right? Symbolically and just throughout humanity, I'm outside on a beautiful day. Thankfully, it's not too hot here today. It's beautiful. And light is good. Light has been great for our ancestors thousands and thousands of years ago uh, as they battled for survival and, 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 and just couldn't wait for the crops to grow, right? Sunlight. So this is a great word, right? Brighter. And it's brighter than the rest of the fence. The reason I'm making a big deal about this is it's easy on a literal level to be like, this is bad. But when you look at the brightness of the edges where he, this elusive person is going in and out, um, you can't deny the brightness. Brightness is good. Light is good, right? All right, very good. Now we get into the actual resort and I'll read a little bit here. The foundations were half full of rainwater, but tapping with the hammer suggested the cement work was sound, and a part where pouring had been finished showed good iron, uh, I'm sorry, and a part where pouring had not been finished showed good iron bar reinforcement. So I think it's at this moment I'd like to share with you what the hotel represents, and it's a, just a wonder the way Paul was able to, to, to pull this off. And I don't think a lot of people see this just reading through the story unless you're really looking for metaphor, right? We are in Jerry's mind, right? We are in Jerry's mind. Early in the text, um, I didn't mention it, but I'll mention it now. Two uh, kind of complex terms, I guess you could say, um, arise. One is the substantia nigra, uh, nigra, excuse me, the substantia nigra, and that is a part of the brain. It's a part of the brain that deals with kind of every, just kind of uh, basic movement, like the way I grab my coffee, the way I'll like stop my phone if my phone's making noise, even, you know, give somebody a hug or something like that. Uh, it's kind of just, it deals with basic movement. It also is the part of the brain that kind of manages, you know, registers this idea of reward and how we respond to reward which is probably so complicated. Uh, you definitely need a degree in psychology to probably figure it out, right? Um, even why am I even putting this video together right now? Probably because it's used for work, which in a sense makes me money and there's a reward behind it, right? Uh, not to mention maybe the pleasure I get from really being able to discuss the literature that I, uh, you know, like uh, and love and spend time with over the years, but maybe there's an aspect of reward to it in my brain is definitely kind of you know dealing with this and this is the substantia nigra the exact part of the brain that deals with those things 
The other thing we get is something called retroverde. And uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. And that means reversing genetic strands, like reversing DNA, changing DNA. Right? So now we're talking about the brain, but also this idea of changing genetic dispositions or, or changing genetics in general to change people and behavior, right? And we're getting to know a little bit more about Jerry's background, the government lab he was working on, the type of work he was doing, exposed to, involved in. But now we're also starting to see it's setting us up for the perfect metaphor, which is this hotel site, right? We are in Jerry's brain, right? And what do we find? The foundations are half full of rainwater. Rainwater, mentioned it before, tears. And it is validated because what has been said about Jerry, all he does is cry one out of every three nights, which is quite often when you think about the weeks passing by there, right? So just somebody who is used to crying himself to sleep, and it's been like this for years. I think it's eight years is the, the number we start to see a lot of. Eight years, right? Another thing, tapping the hammer suggested this cement work was sound. Um, even though there's definitely a lot of repair that needs to happen here, the cement work is good. We're not gonna have to fix anything. Again, we're looking at Jerry's mind and the fortification, the fortification that's already in place. He can do this. He can build back. It's definitely going to be some work here, but he can do it. And lastly, um, we see good iron, bore re good iron bar reinforcement. This is a strong building with good support, ready to just build this quarter left that it has left, right, and, and be a fully functional, awesome resort hotel right ready to go it's all a metaphor for his mind he's ready to he's ready to move on here from his wife not there yet hence this story and many great works of fiction putting us at 1159 we're almost there but something's going to have to happen to get us there right and here we are very early on in the story last thing i want to bring attention to is the poor garden at this resort uh, it's in a state of kind of disrepair. The lighting fixtures were a total write-off, which means they're completely destroyed. There's, you're going to have to replace them completely, right? So um, the garden is important. This is where we start to plug into the biblical themes, the biblical motifs, which are there to definitely express more general kind of sentiments, right, um, that are shared by many religions throughout the world. I always like to mention that. Uh, but of course, this is Western literature. You might find the biblical motifs being used here. And here we have the Garden of Eden. I have a, we have a garden of sorts. And I love it. I love it. It's one of my pleasures uh, is to see everything grow and look nice. And, 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 you know, I don't do it all by myself, but some of it. But isn't that what a garden represents, which is pleasure and leisure and rest, right? Um, so it comes packed with positive meaning. However, the lights, remember we talked about bright and light and how important that is, especially biblically speaking, in terms of religions, right, uh, throughout the world. Those are completely destroyed. So we do have the potential for a perfect state, a return to it, but the lights are completely gone here. Um, I never noticed this until just last year when I was teaching this. And I, I never knew really what to make of it, but I, I think I do now. One thing we see about this hotel resort is a lot of things are, a lot of different areas are in really bad shape. But one place that the vandals didn't go hard on is the shopping area, right? Like the mall. If you've ever been to Caesar's Palace, they got that awesome mall where the skies like changes colors and stuff, right? Kind of crazy. Um, but just a beautiful mall, right? That you can spend all your hard-earned cash at or credit, your hard-earned credit. Um, what this means, I think, remember, we're in Jerry's mind. He comes from a capitalist country. Uh, he comes from uh, a culture that is steeped in consumerism and financial kind of understandings, right, etc. So that makes sense that if this is his mind, that notion, that whole concept of money and consumption 
is what he knows and therefore it's well guarded um, it hasn't been affected that greatly all right whereas other areas definitely have that's definitely my, my most precise uh, kind of read on that the last thing we, we have here oh, oh and I want to say one more thing now that we understand that the hotel is Jerry's mind remember he's, we, there's said to, uh, to be a fence that was put up what is that that could be Jerry putting some some other barrier right his own barrier around his own mind you would imagine now we get into the real world talk right the real world talk imagine losing your wife or husband boyfriend girlfriend partner companion whatever right best friend if you're not you know thinking not on a romantic level um, just imagine losing that person you probably know some people that have and then what I always ask my students is, how many of you know somebody who kind of clammed up after that? Who sheltered themselves and just kind of dug in alone? And maybe that wasn't for the better, right? It started to lead to a deep depression uh, that was dragging them down, right? So, we talk about that fence, right, and the symbolism. Cutting yourself off cutting your mind off from any other possibility except I've lost this person that I treasured so so deeply so dearly and now I'm gonna just kind of stick to myself all right uh, so now the, the metaphor makes more sense for us right as we see that's the big metaphor of this story is that hotel site is Jerry's mind right and we're gonna spend some time there uh, in fact we already are let's learn more about this place uh, it says there were no single rooms there, only guest suites, every one with its own balcony overlooking the Blue Bay. No single rooms. That means this hotel is not made for single travelers. This is his mind. His mind is not made for being single, right? He wants another person in his life. It's been eight years. I think, in, you know, you think about people who lose people. That's a long time to be by yourself, and maybe it is time. Don't forget our protagonist. Another thing that's nice about this story, our protagonist and other characters that he is involved with, they're older. They're in their 40s. And, um, you know, sometimes we find movies are, are so aimed at young people that the only real heroes and men and women that we see tend to be younger. Uh, teens even, if not that, 20s, maybe 30s. But here, I, I like the fact that uh, we're focused on some older, uh, an older protagonist uh, and some other characters. It's, it's nice. So, his mind is equipped for, for someone else, right? What else is here? There's a ballroom. What does ballroom, what does a ballroom represent? Dancing, romance, intimacy, right? Um, and obviously, to be, in a, to be a ballroom dancer, I don't think you can be by yourself. Nah, I don't think that's possible. You have to have someone, right? So we're starting to see that through the detail of this hotel. It's beautifully done. And if you're not looking for it, I don't think the story is as interesting as it, it, it really is, as we start to uh, unravel some of the meaning here, right? All right, we end this section at Li Sung Supermarket, which obviously is a Chinese name here. And if you look up some kind of reference to this, I think the one, and again, this one used to throw me off all the time, like, why are we at Li Sung's? First of all, literally, it makes sense. It's very common for Chinese families to go to Caribbean countries and get residency there and also open up some very staple businesses, such as grocery stores, uh, gas stations, things they know will not go under that are, are necessary and will thrive or at least kind of, you know, uh, sustain themselves, all right? So that makes sense, a Chinese family running this business. The other is this, though. It's a war general. I think it's, it's I, I don't know the details beyond that, but I remember this is a war general. And the, why this makes sense, why would Jerry, you know, what does it mean for Jerry? Jerry thinks to himself, this is a great deal. I'm getting the better of Dick Cavillan, this real estate agent. I'm getting the better deal. And notice that attitude that's a part of him right now. And he's been playing a poker face 
up to this point as well. Dick Cavlin gave him a tremendous offer. He said, we'll even cover all that, all right, Not without getting into too much detail. And um, Jerry's been playing a poker face ever since. And his mentality is, I'm getting the better of Dick Cavlin. Oh, he's, he's going to lose out on this, and I'm going to, emphasize the word here, gain. And I think that is attached to a warlike mentality. When you get the better of someone in any kind of situation, a business deal uh, or war, right, and kind of military involvement, where you're trying to get the better of somebody on a daily basis, it doesn't sleep, right? So I think that's why we end at Lee Sung's on this section. Moving forward in the story, we, he opens up here. We get more exposition piece by piece. He used to work for a government lab, right? So that's tying us back to one of those Cold War countries. Remember, it's in the context of the Cold War, U.S. and Soviet Union, all right? So we're finding out a little bit more about his involvement. Now, he takes a tour of the island. It's his job to kind of just see how things are. Like, I'm a potential guest on this island. Would I want to be here? Before he makes a real estate deal uh, that they're going to spend a lot of money on, right, and have a heavy commitment on. So he wants to drive the island and, and kind of see what's there. Again, we can kind of look at this on a metaphorical level, um, especially in terms of trying to move on and find a new relationship. Let someone else in your life after you've lost someone else through death, right? We'll find out more as the story progresses, but we know she died, right? Um, and, and trying to move on from that. So one thing he notices is that there's lots of potholes <clears throat> and there's a lot of difficult turns to make. And I think that just speaks to the process of moving on. It's not going to be easy, right? There's definitely going to be some rough patches uh, and some difficult transitions, turns, transitions, right? Whatever you want to make of that. So I think it speaks to the process. Um, another one that stands out, on, uh, he, I'll just uh, put it up. There's a wrought iron gate that was the island's officially licensed house of prostitution. So there's this wall and gate. Behind it, there's a, a prostitution house. And um, it's legal, right? So we can, you know, some, in some places it is legal. And aside from that, we just think, what does it represent for Jerry? Well, he's a single guy who's been alone for eight years. And I always ask my students, I say, what do you think has been absent from his life for a long time? And they get it. Intimacy, sexual experience, right? It's been cut off. And what do we have here? A prostitution house that is behind a wall and an iron gate, which means he's been barring himself from sexual experience, right? And just to keep it, you know, on a very mature level, obviously, that's a very important part of a relationship, right? It's a very important part uh, of a relationship between two people. And he hasn't experienced that in about eight years, all right? All right, so we get close to the end of this section and we have the wonderful college kid. Now, why this kid is on a tour bus, a college kid on a tour bus all by himself, I think that's kind of strange, but we'll, we'll take it. Um, but what is, what's his crucial role? To be a bully, all right? And we even get that word here. Uh, he's trying to hit on this woman this uh, woman who's also on the bus. And when that doesn't work out too well, he just starts to bully her, right? And we take that, you know, I th this is where that microcosm, macrocosm kind of comes into play here. The microcosm is this little bus where there's this woman who seems a little vulnerable, and then there's this young college kid who's like, eh, you know, tries to be kind of flirty, flirtatious at first, doesn't work, and then he just gets nasty about it and becomes a bully, right? That's the microcosm. What's the macro? Probably that Cold War stage, right, where we have countries that are trying to assert themselves. Here we have it on the level of interpersonal relationships, but there, of course, we're talking about governments, right, and their relationships to one another. But the bullying, the aggression, the assertiveness. Is the United States of America bullies? I'll leave that up to you. Do your research and find out a good answer to that. Is the Soviet Union, uh, or nowadays U.S. Uh, um, the uh, Republic uh, of Russia, is are they bullies? Do your research and uh, see what you find. Right. Um, I'll leave it up to you. But I think that's the theme: this idea of being bullies. Right. Whether on a world stage or even on a smaller stage, like meeting people. Right. Like we have here. 
they get off the bus. Now, they smoke cigarettes, and this was written in the 60s, and I think people still didn't see cigarettes like it's a, a problem. If you live in California, uh, you know, you, you're, you, it's more of a taboo, it feels like, these days. Um, but I just want to get, get over that. They're smoking, um, and it's something that kind of bonds them as well. It gives them a, a moment to talk. But I think what stands out here is a couple things. They both, the narrator realizes uh, that they are both loners, right? They both are very solitudinal. They stick to themselves. He also says that they are, important diction here, not predatory. Remember we were just talking about the bully and the predator, right? And the aggressive behavior. They are both not predatory, which makes us think about who we are on a level of animals, right? And kind of instincts, right? Predators and prey, which is essentially how most of the world uh, the animal world is laid out, right? You're either one or the other, right? Or you're caught up in between. They also don't want to, the photo opportunity. They don't want the fame. They don't want the, the, the taking the time to, to, to take note of themselves. Oh, let's take a selfie and how egotistical it is. They just want to stand back and not be seen. Again, think of these Cold War countries, the United States and USSR. They want to be seen. They want to make an impact and be, you know, and, and, and everyone to take notice. And that's sometimes why we get the aggressive behaviors and kinds of displays that we get. So they are very different. I always want to show the contrast between these kind of character traits, right, that we've been uh, uh, talking about here. All right. They start to spend some time together. This woman that he's met starts to have a good connection with her, right? And they're going to go on a boat trip. Uh, he is, it's a business trip. He's going to take a lot of pictures of the hotel from the boat, kind of a, a water view, right? Because it's something he's got to do. But he's asked this woman, her name is Edna, to come and join him. So names are starting to kind of arrive here, right? They take a boat called the Esmeralda, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, captained by a, a character named Ildo. And if you look up what this means, all the names are perfect in this text, really perfectly chosen. Ildo translates to fight a battle or a war, right? Now, yes, that could have some bearing on the idea of the Cold War, right? This idea of fighting a war. But I also want to say early on here, think about the war in your mind to overcome some obstacle. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe like our character here, it's the idea of losing a loved one and having to move on from that, right? So that could be the battle. That's the key conflict uh, that is taking place in, uh, in his mind right now, right? And we're getting more information about that. Um, he's asking about the, the shellfish. This, get, this starts to get that science fiction element going again. Um, the different sea life that is uh, available, right, that's actually in, in and around the coast uh, on this island, and he's starting to find uh, more out about shellfish in particular, all right? And Ildo says, um, when it comes January, he said, January, it'll be good, so give it time, there'll be more shellfish in the waters uh, later on. Now, he pronounces January, this character Ildo, and it's written John Orary, so we get the name John. Very deliberately, Frederick Pohl wants to slip in the name John here. And so if we look at John, it really, it, it, it's St. John, the Baptist, right? Because we're starting to get some biblical motifs here. And what it speaks to is the coming of the miracle of Christ, right? The resurrection, I believe. But it's also this idea, on a broader level, the coming of change, which is so important for our character. Again, who's seeking a way to move forward here after the loss of his wife. So maybe, just through the way he's saying this and the reference to John, we start to get an indication that change is coming, right? When we're here uh, ready for it. And here it is, right after that. It's all biblical. Edna Buckner. Buckner is a buck. Buck is prey, right? As beautiful and as powerful as those beasts may get, a buck and deer and all that stuff, they are prey, right? Key names here. I mean, really, really, really deliberate here by the author. And Edna. I had an Aunt Edna. She was awesome. She was awesome. And Aunt Ella. They were sisters. They were amazing. 
Edna means pleasure, and it's also very close to Eden, as in Garden of Eden. We talked about the garden earlier. So you can see how these names are just validating a lot of the prior analysis that we had. Rejuvenation, pleasure, right? Taking us back to a state of perfection. All right. They seem to get along quite well. All right. She starts to open up about her context and why she's on the island, who she's traveling with. She's traveling with her sister and her brother, her new brother-in-law. Or not new, but they're having marital problems. Her sister's name is Lucille. And that's an that's a, that's a easy translation to a motif we've already talked about in the story, which is light, right? Lucille is light. And the, her, her husband that she argues with, they were arguing about the size of their lobsters the other night. Like, it, they both got served their food and he was like angry that his wife got a bigger lobster than him. And I guess he was taking it out on her. Just fighting. But she's light. The only thing said about him is that he has red hair. It was naive of me early on when I worked on this story to think that the red hair was Soviet. I wanted to see this as U.S. and Soviet. But I don't think that it is. I think this is a, a, a very definite biblical motif. We have light, and then we have that which is associated with red, which would probably be something more satanic, right? Something of the beast in us, right? So red in, in, in terms of the hellish qualities of who we are as human beings, the aggressiveness, the assertiveness, the things that can be redeemed by light, right? So I think that's the better way to understand it. But on a literal level, it's just a, a couple that's not getting along too well, and they're trying to go on this vacation to ease their marital issues. And Edna is a third wheel. So she's definitely looking for ways to get away. Now, we find out something about Edna. Remember her last name? Buckner. Pray. What do we find out about her literal past? She was beaten up by her husband for years. I'll read it right here. He beat me about once a week for 10 years, which is, I know we're reading a story, but never forget that reality is stranger than fiction. So, so just the theme of battery, the theme of domestic abuse, right? And we think about the conditions that some, many women and some men, right, may live under. So she's got a lot. Jerry's got things that he's opening up about. Well, guess what? Edna's got things that she's opening up about as well. Um, her husband, husband's name was Bert. This is the only name I think is not very useful for us, so I don't read into it too much. Short for Albert, obviously. And at the end, as she's opening up and she's starting to cry, and notice the importance of opening up, sharing with uh, uh, somebody things about your life, problems, and how important that is for some of us to, to get over things. Some people go to psychiatrists or psychologists or therapists. Some people rely on the loved ones and friends and family and all that stuff. But it is important to share it. So I want to emphasize, she's letting it out with another person. And Jerry doesn't know what to do, right? And I'll use that name now, Jerry. Uh, Jerry Wenright. Jerry doesn't know what to do, but it says right here, Fortunately, my arm did. All of a sudden, his arm, almost disconnected from his conscience in the moment, overrides everything and puts, and, and just, he, he, he embraces her, right, with his arm, right? And that's a little detail that will make more sense. It'll stand out more as we start to learn more about the science fiction aspects we talked about the lobsters, ingesting lobsters, how that might change us. We'll find out more as the story goes on. He goes back to uh, the resort that he's thinking about buying here, that he does buy. He owns, he, he, remember, he took the deal. He thought he was getting the better deal, so he took it. And he, I just want to read this. He says, the only ugliness was the chain link fence that marched around the building site itself. Two things here. We already talked about the metaphorical value of the fence. That's an individual putting a barrier up around their own mind, right? Um, and not being able to move forward. But notice that the key diction here as well, marched. And march, when you think about marching, it immediately should remind you of a context of military, uh, kind of military ideas, right? Soldiers marching, right? The whole idea of movement there. 
Uh, so I think it's kind of combining both of those. The lobsters have returned. Now we find out more about the lobsters. It seems like they are plentiful at this point. Uh, and he's looking at the dock of this resort. And he says, it could handle a fair-sized private yacht without serious dredging. Before, earlier in the story, we talked about the importance of the access road, and it means letting somebody in. I think this is just along those same lines. He's noticing that, yep, a boat could come into dock, and it, the water is deep enough where it really wouldn't, uh, 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 there wouldn't be any dredging, right, along uh, the bottom there. So it means that his mind can harbor another individual. Somebody can come in here. And I think we know who that person is at this point. Uh, Edna, right, Edna Buckner. Um, we find out that Edna is, uh, they're on this boat again, and she's enjoying herself, right? Um, and remember that the name fits the, uh, fits the feeling here, right? Her name is Pleasure, and here she is having pleasure. She's enjoying herself. A little reference here to sharks and barracuda. Uh, he's very worried about the sharks and other predators that are in the water. And I'll, this is a little bit of recall here to see if you can remember what animal, what, what, what sea life did we talk about, do we have a motif of early in the story that is a direct contrast to say the shark? And it would be the dolphin, right? So now we're starting to see we have the prey, we have this idea of predator, right? And we're applying this more to human characteristics than we are even the animals. But the animals are there because they're so concrete. All right. Now, this is key. And this comes right before part three. Uh, and this is where we'll end the first half uh, of this lecture, right? About halfway through. He says, and of course, well, he's looking at Edna in the water and he's just noticing so many similarities to Marge. Marge translates to child of light. So notice the deliberateness of the names here. Marge, his first wife, the love of his life, we, we, we realize how close they were. We get enough detail there to know how important this relationship was to him. That's child of light, beginnings of light. And now we have the possibilities of a relationship with Edna, which is essentially a rejuvenation of light, right? To keep that light going uh, and pleasure, right? To bring that back into his life as an older man in his 40s, having a new relationship. But now, now with all that, I'll read this. And of course, a good deal younger than Marge had been even when I let her die. <gasps> the plot thickens a little bit, right? The guilt definitely starts to intensify. The guilt might not even have been there. I think up to this point, what we just read, that he says he let her die. Up to this point, I think we all just thought it's just a whole lot of remorse, you know, it's a whole lot of longing and sadness about the loss of his wife, but no. There's much more to it. He, he says he was responsible for it, so now this brings in guilt. When you feel responsible for letting something happen, now we're, we're looking at conflicts on a, a, a much more drastic level, potentially. All right, he says, I let Marge die. That's all we find out about. So again, you see how Paul, the author here, is kind of delivering on that suspense. Oh, I got to read more. I got to read the next issue, right, to kind of find out. Last thing we find out, a couple things. After her dip in the water, even with this lingering kind of, you know, uh, uh, worry about sharks and all these things that Jerry's worried about, um, she comes out of the water and she says, God, she said, grinning, smiling. I needed that. And I think it's quite literal. We know that's just an expression that we use, oh God, right? But I think she's being, I needed God, right? Because of the biblical motifs that are here, I think she's saying that's exactly what I needed, right? Um, last thing we find out is that Edna, it's a small world, happens to know Vale Michaelis uh, back in Maryland. Maryland is a very, a very, very nice location for Paul to settle on. Maryland, of course, is going to bring us to D.C., which is the heart of the United States, one of these Cold War countries, right? So that's, so, that's a nice place to be in terms of connecting us to these crucial locations. But it's also going to be the land of Mary, which works on a biblical level as well. The land of Mary, 
Mother Mary, right? G uh, uh, Mother of Jesus. So it's tying us to those ideas of birth and possibility and all of that as well. And that's where she knows Vale Michaelis. A valiant, right, is the first name Michaelis is essentially the power of God, right? The Archangel Michael being one of the strongest angels of God, right? And one of the most valiant as well. Okay, uh, we'll end it there. We can do uh, the second half on a different video. And have a good day.